Spark encapsulates our passion for exploring the vast unknown of unvoiced thoughts and ideas. I'd climbed the Mar Glacier many times, but it was a surprise after 10 years of working at Palmer Station on the Western Antarctic Peninsula to hear the sound of running water under the glacial ice. Ice to water. Well, I knew the glacier had been receding. In fact, we had seen massive chunks of ice falling off the glacial front for many years now. We call this calving, sometimes the size of houses. In fact, 87% of the glaciers along the 800-mile length of the Western Antarctic Peninsula are now receding. We also know that the ice shelves, thousand-foot-thick ice that's attached to land, are beginning to break up. And I want to give you a couple examples. For example, in 2002, the Larsen B ice shelf over on the eastern side of the sound showed striations from an image taken by a satellite. In six weeks, the entire Larsen B ice shelf broke up and went out. This was a piece of real estate the size of Rhode Island. And more recently, in 2017, there was another ice breakout in Larsen C, which was about a 100-mile-long crack that eventually floated free. It was an iceberg the size of, essentially, Delaware. Now, the thing about losing ice shelves is there is some good news. When ice shelves break up and go out to sea and melt, they do not contribute to sea level rise. That's because the ice is already in the water. It's like a glass of ice water. When the ice melts, the water doesn't come over the top. But the concerning news is that ice shelves are barriers. They're barriers to the two to three mile thick ice that covers the entire continent of Antarctica, and a continent the size of India and China combined. And when those ice shelves are missing, the rate of flow of that ice off the continent into the ocean is accelerated. And when ice moves from land to water, it does contribute to sea level rise. It affects sea level rise here in California, for example. Now, things are also happening with the wildlife, with the marine life that I study in Antarctica. The most poignant story is the Adelie penguin. Bill Frazier, as a grad student, came to the station about 45 years ago to study these penguins. He labeled 16,000 breeding pairs of penguins, put tags on every single one. That's a doctoral project. <laughs> he came back every year, every single year, for the last 45 years. And he's found a very difficult story to share. 90% of the Adelis have disappeared. Why? Well, Bill thinks there's a couple of reasons. One is, as it's getting warmer along the Antarctic Peninsula, it's snowing more than it used to. The air is more humid, and it's snowing later. And the Adelie penguin is genetically hardwired to show up at the same time and lay their eggs every year. And then along comes an unseasonable snowstorm and covers the entire colony. And when the snow melts, sadly, those eggs don't survive. So you can lose an entire generation of Adelies in one of these events. The other thing that's happening is the ice itself, the sea ice that doubles the size of Antarctica in the winter and melts away and breaks up in the summer. Sea ice is incredibly dependable. It's so dependable that some species have evolved their ecology around the sea ice, its ebb and flow. So they are sea ice dependent. Adelie penguins are one of them. What the Adelies do is they get down on their stomach and they toboggan across the sea ice to get out to the ice edge. Why? Because at the ice edge, there's huge swarms of krill, a wonderful source of food, shrimp-like animals that feed much of the Antarctic life. Now, with the sea ice disappearing, they have to swim much further offshore, and Bill thinks this puts a stress on their energy budgets. They're not raising their chicks successfully. They just don't have enough energy left. And you know what? The krill themselves, these quintessential base of the food web, are also dependent on the, the sea ice. When they're teenagers, krill live under the ice feeding on little diatoms that grow there as a food source. And so as the sea ice is receding, we're losing krill. Now, there's other species, too. If you lose the krill, that, that could be impacted. For example, the baleen whales. Other species that are sea ice dependent. My favorite seal, the Waddell seal. A beautiful seal that has the most amazing evolutionary adaptation. The female, only the female, has ice chipping teeth. And when she's pregnant, she swims up under the sea ice and she finds a weak spot 
in the ice and she begins to chip. And eventually she has a breathing hole and she keeps chipping and chipping until the, the hole is big enough that she can slide right up onto the ice and give birth. And the beauty of that is the ice edge where the killer whales and the leopard seals are prowling, they cannot reach her pup. And it's all because of her dentition. Now, I don't think the Waddell seal will disappear like the Adeli. Hopefully, they may have to follow the sea ice as it retreats, or maybe they'll go to shore and give birth. We simply don't know. And we don't know what's going to happen with the top predator in Antarctic waters, the leopard seal. 10 feet long, 1,000 pounds. When we see a leopard seal and we're scuba diving, those folks that are in the boat drop a siren into the water and alarm the divers right away. The divers come together back to back. The seal is coming by closer and closer. But eventually the seal will dart off for a minute, and that's when the divers come up and we pull them in the boat as quickly as we can. Now, we don't really think the leopard seal would attack us, but being scientists, we do not want to test that hypothesis. <laughs> leopard seals have never been seen giving birth anywhere except on an ice flow, on the sea ice. So what's going to happen when the ice is gone? Nobody knows. Will they go to shore and give birth? We'll have to wait and see. Now, another thing that's happening in Antarctica as it warms is we're worried about invasive species. And perhaps the one that's grabbed the most headlines in the last decade is the king crab. Known to occur in the deep sea around Antarctica for millennia, it was a huge surprise when 13 king crabs were discovered on the Antarctic slope, moving up towards the shelf. Well, we knew that crabs can't handle cold, and it gets colder as you go up the slope. When you put crabs in cold temperatures, they fall over. They act like they're drunk. They can't feed themselves. They can't regulate magnesium in their blood. It's a narcotic. So what's happening? Maybe as that deep Antarctic current that surrounds the continent is warming, the physiological curtain is opening, and for the first time, king crabs are coming up. Why do we care? Because the animals that live in the shallow seas of Antarctica are not prepared for a crushing predator. You can crunch the shells of an Antarctic clam with your two fingers. We got some grant money from the National Science Foundation and pulled a submarine behind this ship up onto the slope and onto the shelf of Antarctica many times, took hundreds of thousands of images, and I can report to you that there are in fact now king crabs in the millions on the slope. The good news is they have not reached the shelf. All right, so it sounds like things aren't going well in Antarctica, but I want to give you a message of hope, and it comes from Antarctica. How perfect. In 1985, there were two technicians sitting at their desk at a station in Antarctica, and they looked at each other and said, our boss in England is not going to believe these data, and they sent him the data, and he said, you're right, I don't believe the data, you're going back to Antarctica for another year, I'm giving you a new spectrophotometer, you're going to do the measurements again, and they did, and they found the same story. And they published a paper in the journal Nature, one of the most prestigious science journals in the world, reporting a massive hole in the ozone over Antarctica, that layer of ozone that protects us from ultraviolet radiation, that layer that also can influence climate, the wind patterns below. But what was so amazing was not the paper in Nature, but the fact that two years later, 20 countries sat down around a table in Montreal, Canada, and ratified the Montreal Protocol that regulated the chlorofluorocarbons, the refrigerants that were destroying our ozone in the atmosphere. And you know what? It's worked. Today, there are 197 signatories to the Montreal Protocol, probably the most successful global treaty of all time. And the refrigerants, they've been changed. The companies that produced them didn't go out of business. They didn't fire their employees. Instead, they used innovation to come up with something that worked. Susan Solomon, the MIT scientist who discovered the chemistry behind the lack of ozone, the destruction of ozone, told me by mid-century, that hole should close. No longer end of century. What a wonderful model that we might use for our own issues with climate change. And we're connected to Antarctica. Don't let that fool you. The Antarctic circumpolar current is part of the great ocean conveyor belt. And our climate here in, in America is affected by Antarctica. So as I stood there, 
listening to that paradoxical sound of gentle water running under a glacier in retreat, I thought to myself, you know, this is my moment, this is my spark. This is where I become more than just a marine biologist studying marine biology in Antarctica. This is where I take the narrative of Antarctica and I use it to teach the world about climate change. What's going to be your moment? Is it going to be another set of record-breaking temperatures in California? Is it going to be floods in Louisiana? Is it going to be a Category 3 hurricane that comes into the Gulf of Mexico and gets ramped up by the super warm water to a five by the time it hits the coast? Could it be an uncle who dies of heat stroke? We have the technology to leave behind fossil fuels and look at solar and wind and nuclear and hydrogen and maybe even, not so far in the future, fusion. We have the technology, we need the will, we need a combined spark. Thank you.